Okay. Thanks, folks, for uh, coming back. Hope everyone was able to get some lunch. Uh, I know that there are still folks out who are trying to pick up their lunch, and they'll be trickling back in as, as we uh, hear from our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is also a member of the Budget Committee, so you just heard from his chairman. Um, so if you want to have any follow-up questions on budget, you've got another budget member here. Um, but uh, but we are that's not going to be the focus of his, of his talk right now. The focus of his talk right now will be the Indianapolis Colts and, uh, <laughs> and uh, their road to the Super Bowl, which I'm very, very much looking forward to. Um, no, anyway, congratulations on that. That was about pretty cool. It's uh, sad to see Peyton go out like that, but, oh, you know, it is what it is. Um, so Congressman Rikita has been a conservative champion on lots of pieces of legislation. Um, the, and a lot of pieces of legislation have a specific focus on the working class, um, which is one of the major themes that we're discussing here, and, and opportunity for all, favoritism to none. We want to be able to put an agenda together that appeals to the working class in this country, um, not to just those who are well-connected at the top and to those at the bottom, everybody. Um, in addition to the RAISE Act, which will be his topic this morning, uh, he has legislation that would take bold steps on Medicaid reform because he understands the need to change the federal state financing structure, which encourages greater costs and reduces accountability. He also has a red tape rollback initiative, which we like a lot. It's very much in line with our red tape rising project that we produce annually here at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, this, the RAISE Act starts with a very simple proposition. If you work hard, you deserve to be rewarded. Not as a collective group, but you as an individual deserve individual recognition for your excellent work. This simple proposition totally undermines the big labor cartels because it is powerful and it is true. Please welcome Congressman Todd Rikita to the panel. Thank you, Tim. I appreciate that uh, introduction, especially on this uh, cold, dreary Washington uh, day. And the weather's bad, too. Uh, um, you know, Happy New Year to everybody. It's good to be here. I'm, I come again um, with, a, with, with a terrific sense of honor to represent the people of Indiana's 4th District uh, and, by uh, extension, the people of Indiana uh, as a whole. And I'm very proud to be a part of this, um, uh, th this production um, uh, today uh, because heritage... Uh, I think is very, very important. Uh, it has been for the last several decades, and it will be for the future of this republic, um, if we choose to keep it. And I make that paraphrase from that legendary story about Benjamin Franklin coming out of Constitutional Hall, uh, and that what's become that elderly lady that poked his, her finger in his chest and said, young man, <laughs> what kind of country? have you given us? And he paused and said, ma'am, you have a republic if you can keep it. And at the end of the day, I think that's, I know that's what brings me here today. And I think that's what brings uh, you all, whether it's here in the audience today to, 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 to chime in and to tune in or, or online. I'm very pleased to follow uh, the new chairman of the Budget Committee, Dr. Tom Price. He's been a, a mentor of mine over the last four years since I've joined Congress and always comes uh, to the table with uh, a, a, a clear-mindedness, great ideas, and these ideas are bold. And I expect him to follow uh, in Paul Ryan's footsteps in that regard in leading uh, the Budget Committee. Because it's at the Budget Committee where these discussions about keeping our republic by reducing entitlements, reforming the size and scope of our federal government all start with the 302A numbers and the narrative that we put in there about what's really driving what's our $18 trillion of debt right now. Uh, but today, I come with work from the Education and Workforce Committee that we're, uh, that we're focused on, uh, that I expect to continue to gather traction uh, and gain momentum. And I also bring greetings from uh, Senator Marco Rubio, who is uh, the Senate counterpart leader on this legislation called the RAISE Act. Um, and the RAISE Act uh, stands for Rewarding Achievement and, and Incentivizing Successful Employees. And as was discussed in the introduction, it, it's real simple. It's five pages. And so, you know, it's going to be hard for me to get five minutes of just <laughs> talking up here for a five-page bill. 
but it's, it, it really is that simple. It is currently, under current law, illegal to pay unionized employees more than their union negotiates. Now that might be obvious uh, to many of you in the audience, perhaps not all of you, but many of you, but it wasn't obvious to me as a new congressman. I, I, I really uh, didn't understand it till you think about it for 30 seconds or more. Of course, it's not in the unions or the boss, union boss's best interest to allow um, any of their employees to be paid really on merit, to go outside the union contract. In fact, if you think about it a little bit longer, a couple more seconds, it really is against the very definition of unionism. Uh, so this bill, the RAISE Act, uh, would simply allow employers, employers of union shops, to, regardless of the union contract, or in addition to the union contract, give employees a raise based on merit. Their union employee, a raise based on merit. Fairly simple idea, very pro-worker. Some may say anti-union, but I really don't think it's that. It does make the union prove their value to the employee. Uh, and maybe that's a discussion that we should have separately. I do want to be clear, though, that um, the uh, employers cannot selectively, under current law, give raises to anti-union workers to undermine the union. Okay, that's a law as well, and the Raise Act wouldn't make that illegal. That kind of discrimination would, would still stay illegal on the act. The idea that, okay, if you're one of my employees and you start a aggressively going against being anti-union, we'll give you a raise for that. That's still an illegal discrimination. That's not what the Raise Act is about. What the Raise Act is about pure merit. If under whatever objective measure uh, an employee would otherwise uh, get a raise, uh, even if in a union shop, this would make it okay. Economic research uh, tells us that the average worker's, worker's earnings would rise 6 to 10 percent when pay is performance based. We think that passage of the Raise Act could increase the average union worker's salary between $2,700 and $4,500 per year in performance uh, pay bonuses and merit raises. And when you think about, I just read an article today from the United Way in Howard County, which is part of Indiana's fourth district. Uh, families who they've studied are struggling just above the poverty line. And, and that's a worthy of debate as well. What is the poverty line? What should it be? Uh, but it, these families that were studied, the, the, the conclusion was that any kind of upset in their income, where well, certainly a loss of a job, but even a major car repair bill could bump these families down below the United States poverty line. And so that's just the latest example of how people are really struggling. But how the free market, how performance-based pay, how judging people on merit, right? And isn't that the title, basically, of today's uh, summit? You know, uh, fairness for everybody. Base, base people are judge people on how, uh, how they do and what they do, and not on favoritism, how that could really help. Um, it's also, perhaps not a direct answer to, but certainly a pivot for uh, this whole idea about minimum wage, which we know doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Oh, I want that young person to have their first job, part-time or otherwise. I want employers to hire more people, not less. And of course, as we know, raising the minimum wage uh, does the opposite of that. But what a great answer this could be to that discussion, at a, whether it's at the dinner table or, or talking across the country or even the world in a forum like this. The answer to the minimum wage, yes. The way to put more money in people's pocket is through something like the RAISE Act, where people can get rewarded uh, for what they do, for, what they, uh, for the value that they add, for the <laughs> dignity of their work, and not as necessarily a handout to a union-negotiated contract. That's the discussion I think we need to have, I hope we get to have during the panel, 
Uh, that's the uh, kind of uh, discussion I think America needs, I think America expects, and certainly Americans deserve out of true leaders, which again, I find each and every one of you to be. Uh, uh, if for no other reason than you're, you're sitting in here on a rainy, cold Washington day listening to a guy like me talk. <laughs> but uh, again, I want to thank uh, the Heritage, Found, uh, Heritage Action for uh, allowing me to speak today, and I look forward to the great questions and the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, now I would like to invite our panelists. James Shirk is the Senior Policy Analyst in Labor Economics here at the Heritage Foundation. And Diana Fershgoth roth is the Senior Fellow at the Manhattan Institute, and both are leading experts in, the, in this field. Um, and I'd like to invite them up. Please uh, join me in welcoming them, and we'll have a conversation here. Okay, I, um, I would actually like to just, before we get started with questions from the audience, uh, James, if you'd like to deliver a few remarks, and Diane, if you would like to as well, then we can uh, get going. Yeah, I, I think that uh, Congressman Orkita highlights one of the core problems with U.S. labor law, and that's it was written for an entirely different era and a different economy. Uh, the National Labor Relations Act was passed in 1935. It has not been substantively uh, emitted since 1959. Now, the economy was very different back then. And if you think about the, you know, the economy and uh, the, uh, the world uh, the labor law was written for, it was a world when almost uh, it was about a third of the, uh, of the workers uh, in the economy worked in the manufacturing sector, uh, where you know, very, very few women uh, you know, worked outside the home. And uh, in that uh, world and in that economy, you had this notion of general representation, where one union negotiates a contract that covers everyone. Now, when pretty much everyone's doing the exact same thing on the assembly line, you're fitting widget into place, uh, and this is a, a manufacturing economy which was uh, much less, uh, you know, uh, used far fewer skills than, uh, than is the case today, having one contract cover everyone is a workable system. What do you do in a knowledge economy? What do you do in an economy where each worker is not performing the identical task day in and day out, but where the worker's abilities, their skills, their talents, their efforts, are not just you know, core to what the, the employer is looking for, but what the employees are, are looking to be rewarded for. Uh, so much of the work that employees do today is not something you can just you know, reduce to a, a, a computer algorithm. I mean, a lot of those jobs that were just purely routine have been automated. And so in a knowledge economy, the notion of a general representation contract ignores a lot of the value that workers bring to the table. And um, in addition to that, the union movement has not updated their business model. It's not just our laws, but the union business model itself has really not changed since that economy. Uh, if you take a look at uh, everything the unions have been doing, uh, all the, the big uh, you know, policy pushes the union movement has uh, have been uh, getting behind, it's been all about making it harder for workers to say no to their services. It hasn't really been about modernizing their, their offering to be more relevant to workers in today's economy. It's been, how do we make it harder for workers to, uh, to say no to a union uh, contract? So the so-called Employee Free Choice Act, which would have gotten rid of secret ballot elections during workplace or organizing and replaced it with a publicly signed card. You don't try and get rid of the secret ballot if your goal is to, uh, is to attract your customer. I mean, like, if you think you've got a good product to sell, you don't try and say, you know, well, let's uh, allow us to send our organizers to your house at night, and you try and persuade you that way. That's, that's not a sign of confidence in the product, that you're trying to get rid of the secret ballot. Uh, a lot of what uh, I know Diana is going to discuss with the NLRB has been exactly this. Unions trying to make it very hard for workers to say no to their product. And if you look at polls of, of workers, only about one in 10 non-union workers say they want to organize. One in 10. That's why union membership has fallen to a 96-year low. Union membership is now considerably lower now than it was when uh, President Roosevelt first signed the National Labor Relations Act. And so I think the, the solution is to update uh, both U.S. labor law and, uh, and you know, the U.S. labor organizations to also come into the 21st century to be more reflective of today's uh, economy. I think uh, Congressman Rokita's Raise Act is a great way of doing this. I mean, there was a grocery store in Pennsylvania that uh, about two years ago was a giant equal grocery store. They wanted to give two dozen of their hardworking employees a, a raise. They thought they'd done hard work and wanted to recognize that. The union actually came in, filed a grievance, and forced the company to rescind the pay increases that had given those two dozen workers. Like, it, it's not just that they couldn't give it out. They, they'd already uh, uh, handed it out, and they had to go in and lower the workers' pay. Why? because this would disrupt the union seniority system. And some of the newer hires were gonna get paid more than workers who'd been there longer. And that was not allowed. 
I mean, that is so out of touch with today's economy, and uh, I think that's something that needs to be changed. Employee involvement programs. This is something you see very commonly in, uh, in European uh, companies who have either a works council or an employee involvement program where management can come in and, in a systematic way, get input from, their, uh, 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 from the workers in the, in the company and, and how things are run. Now, a lot of companies actually find this as useful. Why? Because they want things to work smoothly. Very often the guys on the, you know, the, uh, the front line of the company have information that the senior executives don't have. And you want to be able to work systematically with them and the, the workplace works better. But under U.S. law, the only way you can have an employee involvement program or a works council program, if it discusses working conditions and wages, is if it's run by an independent outside union. And so that means that a lot of companies do not want to uh, create an employee involvement program because the, uh, you know, the, the pain the union inflicts on them is greater than the benefit they see. And so a lot of workers get stuck with no voice on the job. Or even in cases where the, the company wants an employee involvement program, as we saw in Chattanooga, where it's a, a German company, they they like the employee, or, sorry, the, uh, uh, Volkswagen, it's uh, uh, Works Council. They saw that it's worked really well for them, and uh, so they wanted it in the U.S., but they first had to get their workers to vote for the United Auto Workers. And the workers themselves said, no, we would rather not have... Uh, a, an employee involvement program or a works council program if it means we also have to get stuck with this union uh, when we've seen what it did to Detroit. I mean, what a stunning indictment of the current labor model when the management is encouraging the workers to, uh, to, uh, to vote for a union and the workers, over the objections of their bosses, say, we don't want this union. We don't want what it's going to bring to this company. If that's not a wake-up call to, uh, if for the labor movement to, uh, to update their policies and for the U.S. to update their other laws. I mean, why would we force workers into a, an employee involvement program uh, run by a union if, if they want it to, to be done separately? Uh, I think right to work is also critically important. Indiana just passed a right to work law. We're seeing several other states are looking at right to work. Uh, very excitingly, we're seeing counties uh, in states where the legislature will pass right to work. We're seeing uh, uh, s several counties in Kentucky have passed their own right to work laws based on the, uh, the state's home rule statute that delegates to counties the power to pass economic uh, development measures. Why is right to work so important? Because in a non-right to work state, unions don't have to earn their members' business. They can simply compel it, that they can force you to pay dues or you get fired. So what is the incentive for the union to offer a quality product if they have captive customers? I mean, how does any monopoly act? You know, this, you open any economic textbook, what's it say about monopolies? What's going to happen to prices? They're going to go up. What's going to happen to the quality of your services? It's going to go down. Well, that's what happens in any workforce that's organized by a union. If you're in a non-right-to-work state, you have to pay. We have a study that's going to come out in about two weeks. We find that in non-right-to-work states, unions charge about 10% higher dues and pay their uh, top officers about $20,000 more a year. That's what happens with a monopoly. If you want a, an agile company that is going to serve workers' needs, an agile organization, you have to make them work to, uh, to earn that business. And in too many unions right now, that's not the case. I mean, imagine if uh, AT&T had always you know, maintained their monopoly over the, uh, uh, the phone market. Do we think they would have ever come up with the iPhone? Well, the equivalent of the iPhone is not being uh, you know, implemented today uh, in the U.S. because there's too much uh, coercive power given to workers over unions. We, we, ought, we ought to be updating our labor laws to encourage unions to serve workers instead of forcing workers to serve unions. Uh, thank you very much, Congressman Rokita. I should say that uh, this raise bill is extremely important, and it's very brave of the congressman to take on the union movement by putting forward a simple bill like this a five-page bill, and who could object to someone who works hard at getting a raise? If it passes the House, it passes the Senate, I dare President Obama to veto it. All <laughs> these working men are going to say, working men and women are going to say, why shouldn't I have my raise? Are you going to be vetoing my raise? And uh, what the National Labor Relations Board has been doing recently, uh, going what I think is outside the law, just shows that brave people like Congressman Rakita uh, should be applauded for putting forward these kinds of bills. Just to give you a couple of examples of what the National Labor Relations Board has been doing, just before Christmas, they decided uh, that suits uh, for unfair labor practices against McDonald's franchises, your local McDonald's restaurant, were also going to be counted against McDonald's USA, the parent company they were going to be charging McDonald's USA as a joint employer. 
Now, for the past 60 years, if you work for a franchise, that franchise has been your employer. So if you work for Jiffy Lube, that Jiffy Lube is your employer because it sets your wages. It has the opportunity to hire you, to fire you, to set your conditions of work, your breaks. And now, with a wave of the hand, the National Labor Relations Board is saying a joint employer is the parent company. What it means, of course, is uh, that unions have a lot more leverage over the franchises and to bring unfair labor practice acts because a suit against a local franchise isn't worth very much. But a suit against McDonald's USA, yes, that could be worth billions of dollars. And what these unions want to do is have McDonald's USA sign an agreement saying we will allow unionization of all our franchises uh, in exchange for our not bringing uh, suits against you. Now, I was really curious about how they got the legal grounding to change the law like this. So I called the NLRB uh, because they usually write a legal document called an advice memorandum. I called them up. I said, could I see the advice memorandum that justifies charging McDonald's USA as a joint employer? And the spokesman there said, who asked to remain anonymous, said, well, we have it, but I can't give it to you. We are not releasing it publicly. We are saving it for the trials that we're going to be uh, that are going to ensue against McDonald's USA and the franchises in the spring. So here, they, have, they say that they have the legal reasoning, but they're not letting me see it. I understand some congressmen, maybe even Congressman Rakita has asked for the advice memorandum. They are not giving it to Congress. They're not giving it to me. They're not giving it to McDonald's USA or the franchises that they're suing. And this is something one would only believe about Russia or Venezuela or Cuba. You wouldn't believe in the United States you'd be charged with breaking a law and you wouldn't have the rationale to see why. Now, something else they're doing is, uh, again, right before Christmas, they brought out this quickie election law, which says that elections for union representation have to be held within eight days. Well, in the past, it was 30 days. And part of the 30 days was taken up looking for the bargaining unit which group of people are applicable to join this union. And uh, these people were invited to vote for or against the union, whatever they chose. Well, they've decided, the NLRB has decided that they're going to vote first and then decide who's eligible later. Isn't that a great idea? Well, the two, uh, the two commissioners, the Republican NLRB members, uh, called Philip Miskimar and Harry Johnson, wrote in a dissent from the rule, and I'm quoting, to state the obvious, when people participate in an election, it is significant whether they actually have the right to vote, whether their vote will be counted, and whether the election's outcome will even affect them. In this respect, the NLRB's approach would be intolerable in every other voting context, whether it involved a national political election or a high school class president. Uh, now, this is the kind of thing that, we are, uh, that uh, we are up against. The whole country is up against. The NLRB just changing the rules like this, uh, and unions say that they want higher minimum wages. They say that they want a $15 minimum wage. The SEIU has been uh, promoting this in fake strikes against fast food companies. And in some cases, cities and counties and jurisdictions and states have actually passed a high minimum wage. Seattle, for example, uh, is going to have or now has a $15 minimum wage. But what's really interesting is that in the union contracts, the, uh, the unions are often exempt from the minimum wage. So under the minimum wage law, it says that union contracts are exempt. You have to pay $15 an hour, but if you have a deal with a union, if you allow a union to represent your workers, then you can pay less. So what does it do? It shows that, first of all, the unions don't have any interest in their workers' benefit. Second, that they are doing this to make themselves more valuable. Because there's a high minimum wage, then they go to the employer, they say, look, there's this $15 minimum wage. But if you, sign, if you allow me to unionize your workforce, if you sign what's called a neutrality agreement, which isn't neutral at all, by the way, because it takes away the employee's right to vote, uh, then you won't have to pay $15 an hour. You can pay $10 an hour, $11 an hour. 
Uh, so that's what they are doing in some of these jurisdictions. In fact, they would have done it in here in Washington, D.C., if the Walmart bill had gone through, if it had not been vetoed by the mayor about a year ago. So all I'm saying is these issues are very, very important. We need to congratulate Congressman Rakita on his Raise Act. We need to make sure that it gets through and it gets sent to President Obama. And if he fails to sign it, we need to make fun of him and make it clear and make it public <laughs> that, he is vote that he's vetoing workers' raises. Thank, thank you, you Diana, much. and thank you, James, for, uh, for your comments. Um, okay, well, and, and we're with you on that. That's one of the things that we really want 2015 to be about is an opportunity to put different pieces of legislation on the president's desk and to force that contrast. Um, that's how we get the mandate that we want in 2017 is by legislating in 2015. Okay, so um, I'll take the prerogative and ask the first question, and then we'll, um, we'll open it up to the audience. Um, we've... Uh, a professor named Walter Russell Mead um, very eloquently describes um, w the kind of demise of what he calls the blue model. Um, and when he talks about the blue model, he talks about the New Deal and what's come since the New Deal, which is big government, big labor, um, big business, uh, big institutions um, that, um, that took the country from that period in time to up to modern day. But it's not working anymore. Um, and James, you alluded the, to this in your uh, in your opening remarks that big labor has not updated their business model. I like the Raise Act because I think this is one way to point out that that the blue model is passing away and that that is we're moving from a transition from the blue model to whatever it is. Could you all comment on um, on on whether may, maybe Congressman Rokita it would be valuable to hear what you what you think union members in your district think about this? Do you have hope that they see that? Um, that the, the insufficiencies of the blue model, um, that they um, are open to this new, uh, new model. Thank you for the question, and, and thank you for the compliments, too. I, I appreciate it, although I, I, I did mean what I said during my remarks. This isn't an anti-union bill. It's a pro-worker bill. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's, it's really not a chance to make a union dig as much as it is to recognize recognize that you know workers deserve to be paid for what they're worth to the employer regardless of a union contracts in place or not now it's not my first rodeo here so I understand what this means to the traditional uh, union that Tim's talking about and it's not good but that's not the fault of the raise actor or that's not the fault of the worker who's doing a good job that's the fault of this model that you mentioned sir has been in place since 1930s and completely outdated uh, you know, but that's for the union shop and the stewards and the officers to figure out, again, like I mentioned, how they intend to add value in this 21st century knowledge-based economy. Uh, meanwhile, I'm a conservative, libertarian-leaning, yes, Republican, who wants to do good for middle class and lower class people who benefit from the dignity of work who get their happiness like we all do because we're human from that idea that we add value. Not that we're given something based on whether or not we work or not, but whether or not we add or, or, or meritoriously deserve something. That when we work and we add value, it earns our happiness. I mean, that's what this is about. And unions for way too long have been, not, have been denying people uh, that <clears throat> dignity. That, you're, that you earn your success based on the value you add. Not on the handout you're given based how long you do something or how long you work somewhere or whether you work or not, frankly. And that's a, uh, you know, a whole other discussion about the, the, the scope of entitlements, of the entitlement state today. Um, the uh, letter that, 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 you, that was mentioned earlier, um, uh, we did. Uh, Congress, uh, Congressman Tim Wahlberg, Congressman Richard Hudson and I uh, sent a letter at the end of November uh, inquiring about uh, the McDonald's USA situation. Uh, and, you know, it, it's, it's touch and go with the Department of Labor these days, but we hope to uh, get a response. Also, I'd like to say that um, the Raise Act had last Congress 83 co-sponsors. All right, so this, is, this isn't a pie-in-the-sky bill, and it's not necessarily anything you know, to sneeze at. This is real. If we can cross that 100 uh, co-sponsor uh, threshold, which is arbitrary, 
Uh, but still, I, I think if we can get there early this year, uh, this bill uh, can really, really move. It's doable, and it's, it, it can get to the president's desk. And you're right. What, it, what a great contrast that would be where the president finally has to explain why something so pro-worker uh, help the middle class, help the lower class, uh, help all of us would be so abominable. And I would look forward to that. I'll uh, just uh, briefly add that I think the, the core problem with the blue model, and particularly for unions, is the coercion. That they can force you to accept the contract. The contract that says that you can't accept a bonus or that uh, you can't accept a raise if the union hasn't negotiated it for you. They can force you to pay dues. I, and I think the you know, there's actually a lot the unions uh, could learn from actually the construction trade unions if you just take away that coercion. What do the, a lot of the construction unions do? Well, they run their own job training programs. Uh, they, uh, they you know, basically train up, you know, like uh, building a, uh, you know, some of these large construction projects is very skilled labor. And they actually have their own training camps where they you know, teach workers how to do that. If unions were uh, uh, restructured more along the lines of a, a trade association or a, sorry, an employee association that provided services like job training, so that you know, the union label doesn't mean that, okay, you're going to be a headache uh, for me running my company, but it means this is a high-quality worker who I know I can count on, where the unions provided skill certifications, where the, if they could help workers navigating this global economy, say with things like how do you plan your 401K and uh, advice on you picking mutual funds and index funds for your 401K, providing networking opportunities, uh, you know, a, a, a more modernized version of the, uh, the union hiring hall, uh, you, know, you could imagine a, a union movement. I mean, if they were you know, more often selling or providing their own health insurance benefits, uh, that uh, is we're moving more and more away from employer-based health insurance, if unions became one of the groups offering their own health insurance, I mean, you can very easily imagine a, a union movement that provides value to the workers. But the unions aren't going there uh, right now, except in a, a few handful of, of sectors. And for the most part, that's because of the coercive powers they have. They don't have to make these reforms. It's just a lot easier to say, you guys have to accept our contract, and you guys have to pay us $500 a year, and if you don't like it, you're fired. And it, you know, once we can move away from that, I think there is real value for unions to add uh, value to workers. They're just not doing it right now. It's not just that, uh, that, uh, that, that they are not making these changes. It's that they are on purpose mm -hmm. trapping their workers within the union uh, uh, model, mm -hmm. within the union. Mm -hmm. So James mentioned 401k plans. Well, they don't have 401k plans. They just have the old defined benefit plan where it takes a very long time to be vested. And if you leave around 20 years, then you don't get anything out of it. You have to stay 25 years in order to be vested. You can look at these contracts, which are actually in the bowels of the Department of Labor. You can go and pull these out and look at them. So what they're trying to do is diminish portability, pension portability, diminish the movement. They want to keep people within their own webs. And that, uh, that's uh, extremely harmful for the workers themselves, because these days there's an individualized movement. People go in and out of different companies. I must have had at least 10 or 15 jobs. I joke that I'm working down the think tanks in alphabetical order, <laughs> AEI, Hudson, <laughs> Manhattan Institute. Uh, I wouldn't want to be in one job for 25 years, and most people don't want to be like that either. And the hypocrisy of it, when you can look at the websites and they say, join us for a better pension plan, and yet you can look at the Labor Department data and find that these pensions are 47% funded, or 50% funded, or 60% funded. They're dramatically underfunded, and they need more workers, not so that they can give them a better future, but so that they can be paying their retirement uh, benefits that then go to someone who's already retired, rather than have it uh, just be kept for them uh, for when they retire themselves. So there are major problems in the current union model, and that is why union membership has been decreasing every year. And when the new data come out from the Labor Department in two weeks, we're going to see a further decline of about a tenth of a percentage point. I have it on very good authority. Thank you. Okay, questions from the audience? Yes, sir, right here. I must be missing something. It seems, to me, it seems to me that the panel is in agreement that unions would be against the RAISE Act. However, we're giving them a great opening for the next negotiation. I would like to be the union representative coming to you and saying, we're looking for a raise. It's got to be more than the minimum 
excuse me, than the maximum that any of my workers are making now because you gave this person a productivity raise. You gave them a raise for being a good worker. So we re really want a 20% raise, but the minimum is going to be 10 because you've already said you can afford a 10% raise by giving it to this worker. What say you? Uh, well, uh, one, we, uh, we know that the unions have already come out uh, quite strongly against this bill. Uh, last time it uh, came out, uh, you had uh, one of the Teamsters affiliates called it, and I quote, the boss's pet provision. A and that's really their attitude, that uh, the, the workers who are putting in the, the extra hours and are, are really uh, you know, we are putting in the elbow breeze. You know, it's not, all right, that's hard work. You should be commended for that. It's much more, oh, he's the boss's pet. Why are you working so hard? You're setting a bad example for the rest of us. So we know, first of all, that uh, they're against it. Uh, secondly, I mean, the, the unions are always pushing for higher wages. They don't need any sort of you know, excuse. Or, well, you've already showed you can pay that. Well, what the guy, what the, the business has showed is that when that worker is that much more productive, that he's created additional profits that enable him to pay the higher wage. I mean, that's that's what the uh, the academic research on performance pay finds is that both business profits go up and the workers' earnings go up, as, as the Congress mentioned, uh, six to ten percent. But it comes out of the higher productivity. If you don't have the higher productivity, you don't have the money to pay the higher wages. And I think that's something the unions uh, would understand that, you know, if, if you, the fact that you've given one hard worker a 20% raise doesn't mean you've got a, a pot of money that enables you to give that to the entire uh, uh, entire bargaining unit uh, you know, without running uh, a deficit. The most dramatic example of, te of uh, unions coming out against merit-based pay is the teachers' yeah. unions in uh, New York and other parts of the country uh, where where uh, states and city governments have offered them uh, higher wages in exchange to go along with the merit-based pay. In other words, if they take away the tenure, they have merit-based pay, they can all be earning much higher wages. And unions have come out solidly against uh, this kind of compensation because they just don't want, they want it only on the basis of seniority. They don't want younger, more productive teachers to have higher pay even though this would benefit our children. This would give our children better educations and uh, a higher expected lifetime earnings on top of that. But they're still against it. Right here, sir. That leads to my question of what percentage of unionized employees are working for the government and being paid by taxpayers? Uh, it's roughly 50%. Uh, so it's uh, actually a stunning statistic uh, that we found a few years ago. Uh, when I say union member, What's the image that pops into your head? Most of you guys, it's going to be a guy in a, in a hard hat or working on assembly line somewhere. There are now more than twice as many union members in the post office as the entire domestic auto industry. That really, they, you know, they've shifted into government. Yes, sir. Are, is there your work on the RAISE Act still um, precluding you from pursuing the general uh, right to work? Are you, uh, uh, provision, or are they still uh, plans to go with, you know, promote right to work, you know, merit shop type legislation? Thank you. Uh, two separate issues. Appreciate the question and the clarification. Uh, this doesn't really impact or, or have to do with uh, right to work. Maybe it, it does impact. I'll let the experts chime in on, on their observation there, but it's not intended that way. It's really two separate issues. And um, as far as a, a national right to work push, um, if that was your question, I'm seeing much more action and, and interest at the state level than anything that we're doing in Congress. Yeah, this, this wouldn't impact right to work one way or the other. It's a completely different section of the act that it, it would deal in uh, modifying. But we do see more and more states becoming right to work. And interestingly enough, right to work states have created more union members over the past five years than forced unionization states. Why? Because there's more economic growth in the right to work states and uh, union membership grows more. So unions should be in favor of right to work if they want to increase their membership. Other questions? All right, what are the prospects on this? How do we get this moving across the House floor? Um, you know, I always get this question. I'm asked to be Kreskin of some sort. <laughs> I probably get uh, I have a different job if I was right. But um, look, we just we got to we got to just keep pushing it. Um, one of my 
people ask me, you know, still as a relatively new member of this, I'm starting my third term, and people have always asked me what my observations were coming in as a new member, and I have several of them, but one relevant to your question is um, I didn't realize how many quote-unquote pro-union Republicans are in our conference until you realize, frankly, um, why the Bacon, uh, Davis Bacon Act, for example, fails on, on, on rider votes and appropriations, some of these other things. It just was a, it was, <clears throat> it was new to me. I didn't expect that. And, I, and again, I've said it three times already. I'm not anti-union. I grew up in Northwest Indiana. I'm the second person in my family to even go to college. Um, I grew up around a dinner table that that always talked about the. <laughs> social and economic value of a union. We, you know, I grew up in the shadows of steel mills. You know, this is pro-worker to the extent it, provi it, it, it provides challenges and perhaps there are opportunities uh, for unions. That's a separate discussion and all that. But I do know this would help workers because it rewards them for the dignity of their good work. And that's what we should all be about. Um, and so, you know, I think there's going to be an initial <gasps> suck in you know, of the breath when, when, when some members hear of this. Uh, but if they really think it through, and that it's all our jobs, including mine, chiefly and Senator Rubio's as well, uh, but really all of ours to have this discussion with members of Congress and the broader communities, uh, this can move. 83 co-sponsors, last Congress. Easy to re-up those 83, build on that, cross the 100 uh, co-sponsorship threshold, and move this to the Senate and then to the president's desk and let him explain himself. <clears throat> yeah, I, I would uh, add just, uh, I see the unions having a very difficult time arguing against this. I mean, the, the rhetoric the, the last time this came up, uh, there was a, a vote on the, uh, the Senate floor. It was offered as an amendment by Senator Rubio. And uh, actually all but one of the uh, Senate Republicans uh, voted for it. Uh, but the, the rhetoric of the unions around that time, it, like I said, the boss's pet provision. And then you had uh, Mary Kay Henry, the president of the SEIU, coming out and saying that those would allow employer to get, hand out, quote, arbitrary and unfair pay increases, end quote. <laughs> Do you know any worker who believes that they've received an unfair pay increase? You know, I'm, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that uh, most people in this room and, uh, and watching this would be more than happy to receive an arbitrary pay increase, as long as it was an increase. <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, the, the, that sort of rhetoric, it, it plays well within a very narrow slice, I think, of the, the population. But most people, you know, you start talking like that and people think you're from Mars. I mean, it, let's, by all means, let's have more arbitrary pay increases. The more, the better, please. Uh, so I, I, I think the, the arguments that workers ought not be able to, uh, to receive a performance pay or, I mean, this is, this is only one way. You can only raise the wages above the contract and the, the bill as the, right. the congressman's written right. it. Uh, I mean, yeah, that's going to be a tough argument for them to make outside of the, the very narrow subset of the population who's you know, wholly bought into the union model. And I, I think that's a subset of the population that's shrinking every year. Great. Well, this is a... Sorry, Dan, did you want to add on that? Oh, uh, it's because under the union model, it's just the more senior workers that get raises, and that's very important for them, the seniority model. And uh, reversing that with the Raise Act might make younger people uh, get uh, raises, whereas some older, lower-performing people wouldn't. Uh, and uh, that's where the union has a fundamental disagreement. Great. Thank you. Well, this is a great issue, and uh, this, uh, Congressman, is a priority issue for us here, so we'll be doing everything we can to help you push it and uh, look forward to action on this issue in 2015. Um, thank you to the panel and to Congressman Rokita. Thank, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Take a 10 minute break, folks, and uh, we'll start our next panel or uh, next uh, session at 3 o'clock. Thank you.